grateful that you're here. This evening, it does seem like it's a lot later than what it really is, doesn't it, with the change in the clock and all of that. So I just, I just am glad to be with you. I want you to turn to Ephesians chapter 2 with me, and we're going to read beginning with verse 14 in just a minute. In B. Hardiman, I don't know whether you recognize that name, but he was one of the old gospel preachers that we read after and, and just really admired the work that he does and did. And so I thought about a story that came with him, and I'm just going to tell you that story. It's just about that long. He was holding a gospel meeting. He was teaching over in the area of Nashville, and he was holding a gospel meeting down somewhere in Mississippi. And so on Sunday morning, he got up and preached one of the fine lessons that he was capable of doing, and everybody there slapped him on the back and told him what a great job he had done, and he went out feeling good. Came back on Sunday night, and there was about 20 or 30 percent of the people that were there on Sunday morning. And he preached another great lesson, and the same activity happened, but then came Monday night. Monday night, while everybody was gathering, but the preacher wasn't there. So they thought, well, maybe he's sick. We'll check on him. So they went down to the hotel where he was staying, and he was sitting out on the front porch. Just sitting there taking it easy. He knew somebody was going to come and check on him, you know. And so finally two or three of the men came down and said, Brother Hardman, don't you know that you're supposed to be preaching tonight? This is Monday night. This is the first night of our gospel meeting. He didn't say very much. He just kind of said, you know, I looked at the crowd last night. And I thought they really weren't interested in coming back on Sunday night. And so since they weren't interested to come back on Sunday night, and since Monday night's normally the low count at a gospel meeting, he thought I'd just join the crowd that wasn't going to be there. And so that's kind of where it went back and sang a few songs, and, and that was it. Tuesday night came around, and I'm going to tell you, there was a change in the heart of the people there because they had paid him a whole lot to be there, and he had just simply said, you don't come, why should I? And so I'm grateful that you're here, okay? That, that's what I wanted to say, and I hope that I said it in a way that didn't offend you, okay? I'm grateful always to stand before the group and talk about Jesus Christ. He is both Lord and Christ in our life. And if he's not in yours, he needs to be. You need to let him have that place of honor. And so as I begin to read here in the text, uh, beginning with verse 14, it says, For he himself, that's Jesus, is our peace, who has made both one, and has broken down the middle wall of separation, having abolished it in his flesh, the enmity, that is the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so as to creep aid in himself one new man from the two. Now that's Jew and Gentile he's talking about there. Thus making peace, and that he might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross, Therefore, putting death to the enmity. And he came and preached peace to you who were afar off and to those who were near. For through him we both have access to one spirit and to one father. Now, most of us wouldn't stop and think about the law of Moses being the very thing that he talks about here with the idea that, wow, that's the dividing that's the divisive thing between Jew and Gentile. I was thinking about the church. I was raised without knowing anything about the church, certainly didn't know anything about the cross. 
And all the scripture that I knew was chimney corner scripture. And all that means is it didn't come from the Bible. And so every now and then there was a guy there that was kind of a hobo when he came to our place and stayed there many years. And he was kind of a critic of the Bible. And he was certainly a critic of his father who was a preacher for a religious group that was not the church of Jesus Christ. But he had a lot of chimney corner scripture. And so he would quote that to us, and we thought, well, he's old. He knows what the Bible says. And we'd go along, and somebody else would come along, and we'd quote that, and they'd say, you know where that came from? And we didn't know where it came from, so we'd say it came from Doc Logan. That was the guy that was telling us all of that. And so that's kind of what we were raised up with. Now, it's hard to get rid of things that have been planted into your mind if you're a child and lay them aside for something that is the truth. All of us came from some place in life, but I'm going to tell you, all of us were sinners and we needed to be saved by the grace of God through Christ Jesus. We needed that. And so in the text here, in my introduction, I put down a verse, a portion of that. <clears throat> it says, He, Jesus, Himself is our peace, who made both groups into one and broke down the barrier of the dividing wall and might reconcile them both in one body to God through the cross by having it put to death with unity. You know, you know I think that we don't realize how much of the old law of Moses has crept into the church of Christ today. Now, I'm meddling a little bit, and I know that, but I've been to the places where it's happened, and I've talked to them about it, and I've asked why, and they said, well, you know, what we, what we need to do is teach more and preach more incidentals than the pattern of New Testament Christianity that you mentioned in 2 Timothy 1 in verse 13. And so when we hear and see in our congregations around Houston, I'm saying, that people are doing things that are contrary to the teachings of the pattern that Paul gave to Timothy and to others, to stop and think about it from the standpoint of much of that is the law of Moses. Now, I want to give you a passage of Scripture to look at, and I'll read just a little bit to you in 2 Corinthians chapter 3. I want you to note here, <clears throat> here's something that we need to be there for, uh, might remind it of. Listen to what he says, beginning with verse 7. But if the ministry of death, that's a pretty deadly ministry, isn't it? But if the ministry of death, written and engraved on stone, what ministry was written and engraved on stones? Do you remember? It's the Ten Commandments, wasn't it? And so he said, if it was glorious, and it was at the time, so that the children of Israel could not look steadily at the face of Moses because of the glory of his countenance, which glory was passing away, how will the ministry of the Spirit not be more glorious? For if the ministry of condemnation, that's the stones, that's the Ten Commandments, had glory, the ministry of righteousness, that's the New Testament teaching of Christ and the Apostle, exceeds much more in glory. Now, he stops there for a moment, gets a breath, and then he completes that in that chapter. He starts in verse 12 by saying, Therefore, since we have such hope, we use great boldness of speech, unlike Moses, who put a veil over his faith so that the children of Israel could not look steadfastly or steadily at the end of what was coming to pass away. But their minds were blinded, for until this day that same veil, listen, remains unlifted in the reading of the Old Testament because the veil is taken away in Christ. The veil he's talking about that would cause people to bind the law of Moses on people and say that it was just as important to salvation 
as the salvation that we have in Christ Jesus. He said that veil remains if we continue to look at the old covenant and try to bind that on people. Nevertheless, when one turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now, listen to me. If we understand the New Testament covenant, the New Testament church, we know that it is the Word of God, that it was given by Christ in His life's will and testament, written down by the apostles and prophets, and sent by the Holy Spirit. Now, that's what he's saying. And so he says here then, Now the Lord of the Spirit, and the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Now, what he was saying is, if we put as much, shall I say, emphasis on Old Covenant teaching at the expense of not teaching New Covenant ministry, that church is going to have difficulty. And when that gets into the leadership of the church, you would be surprised what the story is as you talk to people who are involved in that. And so in looking at our text in the cross in the church, the cross did not in any way inspire people under the old covenant. It's mentioned in the Psalms as that which is to come with the new covenant. For to understand that we live under the new covenant that was given by Christ, and that was written in the Word, inspired by the Spirit, then we're not going to have a problem understanding the difference between the cross and whatever group it is when we study about the cross and the church. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, 18, he says, The word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us excuse me, who are being saved, it's the power of God. It's not the wooden unit that was made and stuck into the ground by the Gentiles, the Romans. It was the person on the cross, Jesus Christ, that hallowed the cross. He was the one that hallowed the cross. And so, without question, the Holy Spirit shines a light on the cross of Christ as the centerpiece, the central message of the Bible. In first study of studying of 1 Corinthians 15, he's going to say, I'm going to talk to you a little bit, and here's what I'm going to tell you about. Of first importance, Christ died, according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He was raised, according to the Scriptures and that there were eyewitnesses and names, the apostles, names 500, by, not by name, but as a group that had seen Jesus after the resurrection. And so when you stop and think about that, that's a light. That's important to us to know that. Somebody says, how do you study with and finish the sentence? Well, you start at the beginning. Why not just present the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Why not? Mm, I don't know why we don't do that. Because the resurrection of Jesus Christ is the theme point of the, of the New Testament. His resurrection. And so if we can't read the scriptures and point to the testimony of the witnesses to that, then we need to get back in Bible class and learn how to do that. It's amazing how powerful the Word of God really is. A striking feature of the New Testament is its message. The message is that the cross and the church are intimately joined together, combined into one plan as God's gift of grace to all humanity. And so when you stop and think about that, this study then reveals how the church is connected to the cross. If we don't see that, we need to study it again. And that's not being disapproving of anybody in here. It's just, where have we been spending our time in studying the Word of God? So I, no I noted here that 
we need pray maybe just to take another look at that. Now, if I preached that here to folk before, praise the Lord. I'm going to make sure that it's preached here. And I want to make sure that we believe it because it comes from the Word of God. We take our time sometime in saying, you know, the book of Ephesians is written about the church of Christ. And it is. But have you thought that the book of Colossians is teaching the Christ of the church? The Christ of the church. You can't have the church, and I'll say this three or four times, without the cross. And you can't have the cross without the church. You say, Bill, we've heard this. Well, let's hear it again. Okay? There might be somebody that needs to hear this. We often say, the people that need to hear this are the ones that are not here. Well, now you can go and talk to people. In our class this morning, we had a little challenge there presented to the class members with the idea of how do we start a movement with people coming back to the congregation, to the church here at Waters Road. And we talked about it a little bit, didn't make any decisions on it, but it had to do with the people that were in that Bible class. It takes people. God used people. He didn't use angels. He didn't use just preachers. He used the body of Christ, the church, to get the message out. Isn't that a wonderful, wonderful thought? Christ purchased the church with his blood. Acts 20 and verse 28 where he says, Take heed unto yourselves and unto the flock over which the Holy Spirit's made you overseers to feed the church of God, listen, which he purchased with his own blood. Now the church of God which he purchased with his own blood, was Jesus Christ. You can read the text and understand that. And so I thought about that. I put we respond to the sacrifice of Jesus in several ways. The redeemed rejoice over Christ's gift of grace. He gave up heavenly glory for us. In 2 Corinthians 8 and verse 9, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, Yet for your sakes he became poor, so that through your poverty, through your poverty, you might become rich. Isn't that a marvelous thought? You might be wringing your hands thinking about how poor you are, but if you're in Christ Jesus, you're rich. You've got a home in heaven. You've got a Savior that has paid the price for your sin. You have one that you can count on in times of difficulty. You have a Christ that cares about you. We're rich. We're really rich. Mm. I put we respond to the sacrifice of Jesus in several ways. I put we embrace the cross by appreciating what Christ did. And I thought in terms of we accept the benefits of his death. True appreciation leads to proper acceptance. By faith and obedience to Christ, we take the benefits of his death into our lives. Romans chapter 6, verses 1 through 7. So we respond to his sacrifice with the abounding service that we give in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 58. Service. Isn't that marvelous? That you just, if just a cup of water is all you have within your hand, then just a cup of water is all that God demands. But are we willing to sacrifice just a little bit? Just a little bit. Hmm. The cross creates the church. No cross, no church. It takes us back to Calvary, doesn't it? Let me talk to you a moment about Calvary. Let me talk to you about the enemy of the cross. Let me talk to you a little bit about the devil, okay? Sometimes he's called Beelzebub. Sometimes he's called Satan. Sometimes he's called other names in the Bible. But all of them basically present to us craftiness, ungodliness, usurping the authority of God or trying to. And when all else fails, he will attack the church. That's Revelation chapter 12. He will attack the church with the idea of trying to destroy us. 
Well, there was a struggle that was going on through the old covenant where Satan is doing his best to destroy the cross in Jesus Christ. Doing his best. Sometimes it got down to where there was just one human being left between destroying the seed line of Christ. One person. And yet that one person made it come together. You ever read the story about Hadassah? Oh, Esther is her name. It was down to her. You remember what Uncle Mordecai said? He says, God is going to redeem his people. And here you have an opportunity to bless his people. Who knows but what you've come to the kingdom for such a time as this. We just sometimes don't think in terms of how God has entrusted the gospel to us here. And it's a marvelous, marvelous story. And so in looking at Christ in the attack on him by the devil, you remember when he was born that the king wanted to kill all the babies two years old and under? Why was he doing that? He wanted to kill Jesus when he did that in Bethlehem. You think in terms of how many times the devil really tried to kill Jesus. Do you remember the time in Matthew chapter 4 where he was led to a mountain, where he was led to the, the, the uh, temple and all? To, the devil is saying, here's what all, all I want you to do. I'll let you have all of this if you'll just fall down and worship me. Wow. The devil is trying to kill our Savior. I tried in my mind and see if you can do this better than me. The day of the cross, the day Jesus died on the cross, when the devil and his group, the demonic world, were watching as the Son of God was going to die, I would happen to believe that they were rejoicing in the fact that they had defeated the God of heaven because they'd been in warfare against the God of heaven through the centuries in the old covenant time. And here it is. Here's the cross on the hill of Calvary. And the son is going to die. The son died. You see, the devil didn't have the power over the son of God as he did us. We've sinned. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We know that. But Jesus did not sin. And since Jesus did not sin, the power of death that the devil was so proud of made no difference where, as on the first day of the week, Jesus was raised from the dead. Now there's a lot said in the Bible about binding the strong man. He's talking about the devil there in other passages of Scripture. But Jesus had to, it was his responsibility to die for your sins and for my sin, and God chose the place for it, and it was on Golgotha, on the cross, where people would look at him and say, mm, he was such a good guy. Some would look at him and say, he's been following the devil, the devil finally got him. Or some would say, I wonder what God's plan really is. And I stop and think about that, and I thought, wow. I noted that the cross continually cleanses the church. Be saved. Keep saved. Cleansed by Christ's blood in baptism, Acts 22 and verse 16. Isn't it amazing that one of the chief People that the devil worked with was a fellow by the name of Saul of Tarsus, putting Christians to death, causing havoc, Acts chapter 8, against the church. But he met Jesus Christ on the road to Damascus. Do you remember that? Why, that was quite a confrontation, wasn't it? Saul didn't really realize that he was in that bad a shape, but he was. 
He was lost, separated from God because of his sins. And yet when Jesus confronted him, he said, So, why? Why are you warring against me? Now, Saul was warring against the church. Who's the head of the church? Jesus Christ. We know that, Ephesians chapter 1. We know that. He's the head of the church. He is our captain. He is our savior. He is the, the general that's leading us in the army of Ephesians chapter 6. And we march into hell many cases for a heavenly cause. Wow. We were cleansed by him. By Jesus Christ's blood and baptism. I put he is continuing and we're continuing to be saved by our walk in the light. 1 John 1 and verse 7. We're walking in the light. We're not running. We're walking in the light. I don't want to make light of what that says. But what that says is there's a walk that can be distinguished by people around us of whom we are and whom we serve in comparison to the people we choose to act like we serve. I look at, at the United States like you do and wonder why when there's an election and the people elect a person to be a president that there's a warfare set up against him rather than a prayer vigil in his behalf. Try reading Romans 13. It will enlighten us with the idea that our responsibility is to pray for these people, these policemen, and pray for these, these men that are in authority. And that will make a difference in the long run. It will make a difference, you know. Walking in the light. Wow. I like that. We can do that. I'll say a little more about that. By our walking in the light, the blood of Jesus continues to cleanse us. In 1 John chapter 2, verses 1 and following, I put walking in the light includes honestly doing His will, John 5, 1 John 5 and verse 3, admitting our sinfulness in 1 John chapter 1, verses 8 and verse 10, and by correcting our sinful life, 1 John 1 and verse 9. All of it's right there in 1 John chapter 1. Wow. We don't have to be afraid of God. We don't have to be afraid of Jesus Christ. We just simply submit to Him. The Christ of the church. He's the head of the church. A lot of people would say, I don't like the church in the Bible. You can't have the church in the Bible without having Christ Jesus. Some will tell me, I just live by my walk in the woods and God talks to me and tells me that my walk is all that he's talking about here and just being a good old boy, everything's going to be all right. That's hogwash. That's chimney corner scripture. That's not what the Bible says. I'll close with this thought. In 1 John chapter 2, beginning with verse 1, one, he says, Moreover, little children, I write unto you that you may not sin. Listen, but if any man sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and he, Jesus, is the propitiation for our sins, and not for our sins only, but for the sins of the world. He is the atoning sacrifice, the NIV will say. But He is the propitiation, which simply means this, that if we're walking in the light, if we're walking with Jesus Christ, God doesn't impute sin to us because Christ cleansed us from that sin and continues to cleanse that. So we don't have to worry about going about saying something that causes us to think we've blasphemed the Holy Spirit. Blaspheming the Holy Spirit just simply means we do not accept the saving blood of Jesus Christ And without the blood of Christ, we will not be in heaven. Without the church, 
we will not be in heaven. Without our sharing our faith, somebody won't be in heaven. And so when you stop and think about the cross in the church, all I'm saying is you are a part, if you are a member of body of Christ, the church of Christ, the bride of Christ, if you are a member, you have an anointing. We don't think about that. I might have mentioned that here before. If I didn't, I'm mentioning it now. And that anointing means that in the eyes of God, we're in the body of Christ, and there's salvation, Acts 4 and verse 12, and none other than Jesus Christ. He loves you. He really loves you. He's willing to give and give and give and give and give so that we might respond by not only becoming a Christian, but living a Christian life and understanding that we can be forgiven. I think that many of us wrestle with the law of Moses because under that law, if you were guilty of one of the commands, you were guilty of all of them. That's not New Testament Christianity. Paul mentioned that. wasn't Paul. James mentioned that in the book of James where he says in that text there, boy, you've got something good. You've got something good going for you. You've got the cross of Christ going for you. You've got the church that he purchased with his blood going for you. The brothers and sisters in the church care about your soul. They'll weep whenever you weep, and they'll rejoice when you rejoice. We don't think about that that often. What really? rejoice well there's another sermon there but I won't go into that since I'm about used up my time now all I'm saying is don't you be ashamed please don't be ashamed of the church that we read about in the Bible the new covenant don't be ashamed of that don't be ashamed of Jesus Christ who gave his life that we might have life. Him who knew no sin, God made to be sin. That's a tough passage in 2 Corinthians 5 in verse 21. Him who knew no sin, God made to be sin so that we might become the righteousness of God. We're the righteousness of God. Isn't that a marvelous thought? That's who we are. And that's who we need to be. And we understand without the cross it cannot be. Romans chapter 6, know ye not that so many of us were baptized into the death of Christ? When we're baptized, we die with Christ. That's the old man of sin. He says in that, as he continues in verse 4, that we're buried with him, that we're buried with Christ. And then he continues in verse 5 with the idea that we're raised with Christ. The death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ fits into our life, fits just perfectly with Romans chapter 6 because he'll say as we continue reading in verse 6 that our sins are done away with when we are involved in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Isn't that a marvelous thought? We die with him, we're buried with him, we're raised with him. And he says we're raised with him in Romans 6 as you complete the rest of the chapter. He just keeps on saying better and better and better things about us. Starts with the cross. What will we do with Jesus? What would we do with Jesus? Now, that's a good place to start a Bible study with somebody. You know, you don't have to get in an argument over this, that, and the other. Just start with the basic fundamentals. Is Jesus Christ really the Son of God? You know, before we baptize anybody to Christ, we have to ask the question, do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? And if they're not willing to agree to that, then more teaching needs to be done. If just sticking people in water would save them, we are big enough to grab people and wrestle them down and chunk them in the water. But that's not what he's talking about there. He's talking about people who want to die and be buried with Jesus because that's where they go back to the cross to receive the 
cleansing of his precious blood that was shed there. This first principles come to Jesus while together we stand and sing.